welcome everybody. Please join me in the pledge.
talk a little bit about our journey. I want to take everybody back to bring us to where we are right now. Sorry. Okay. So um, one of the things, one of the programs that we've had for a while in Seaford is growth mindset. So when I first, when I first came to the district in um, 2017, in, in July of 2017. Some of the work had already been going on here in Brooklyn, in 16, 17. Um, the Zemmerich and the Manor was, was kind of like the powerhouse school that was forging forward. And it was one of those points where um, he had, she at the time had been working with 17. He wrote the book on the far right, Growing a Growth Mindset, which is basically a continuation of some of the work. The guru of growth mindset ideology is, is Carol Dweck. Um, just so everybody knows, um, we took a hiatus a couple of years because we couldn't really do meaningful book talks, but um, every new teacher gets a copy of Mindset. We do a book talk as part of our professional development that we do with, during our new teacher workshops. And um, Dr. Jacob and I do an orientation. We spend a lot of time talking to the new teachers about the SEL programs. So these are some of the things that built up to our having this focus on, on fixed and growth mindset. Um, that work was being done in 1617 during 2016 also, the Manor School participated in research that Kevin Sheehan was doing on using children's literature to reinforce growth mindset or to teach growth mindset and make children aware of how to think of things a little bit differently. Um, and then to the point of where um, in 2017, um, they presented Deb and Kevin presented at the Long Island ASCD. Uh, and it's really important when we're getting the name out there and Secret is out there and presenting and contributing to our larger educational community. So just to remind everybody, um, the, the concept of a growth mindset is that you're continuously looking at getting to the next point. Um, you believe that learning is continuous. You do not believe that you're entrenched in, in a fixed ability to learn or, or do something. And um, you inspire other people to be successful too. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this because this is kind of like a recap of the work that we've been doing. Um, when we take a look at habits of mind, um, again, when I came here in 2017, a bunch of us went to Long Island ACD again. That's like the big think tank for professional development. And um, I was sitting with Mr. Colino and there was a flyer on the table and they said that Ben Cowan was going to be at the New York ASCD. And I looked at him and I said, we have to go. So I came back, Deb smiled at me because I was like, and I said to Deb, I said, we really should go to this. This is really good for kids. So it was John Cipollino, um, Deb Emmerich, uh, Tom Burr, and I. And we went up to Union College and we went and we saw Benna. Now I've worked with Benna in my like 20 years of my career, I worked with Benna before, so I know her very well. And she was there and she was presenting and they kind of fell in love with her and she fell in love with, you know, working with our district again. So she um, she came here and did some professional development with us. She spoke at our um, superintendent conference day. We had her as a keynote speaker. And then John and I presented uh, Heaven's Mind at NACO. And then um, we've also had other schools visit us. Just like we go out on school visitations when we want to see cool things going on in the districts. We've been a place where people have come to see the implementation of Heaven's Mind here. And again, very impressive. In June of 2021, we became internationally recognized Habits of Mind Learning Communities of Excellence. So uh, both the Harvard and the Manor schools. And again, these are the 16 dispositions that if you demonstrate these behaviors, it makes you a more effective learner. And our kids have really internalized this. You know, kids will walk around understanding that, you know, it's really good to manage impulsivity. It's really good to listen with understanding and perspective. And they know this, and it becomes part of their vernacular. And when we do things, we bring it into real life situations. So have it to mind recap. Then we started with Google. Because when we came back, this I actually have to credit Nicole Schnabel. I think, Ms. Percy, you were the only person on the board at that point in time. Um, when we were interviewing, and we had to do uh, entry plans for the principal positions, one of the things that Nicole has. <laughs> Um, one of the things Nicole had in her entry plan was, was hooking up with Mark Brackett and the research on ruler because, and we didn't know how serendipitous it would be because of the pandemic, but this concept of, you know, not all kids enter the classroom in an equal way. You know, sometimes there are things going on. So there's a way of really 
charting where is a child with regards to their energy level and their pleasant level. So ideally, like you want somebody, hopefully in the yellow and the green areas, you know, where you're, you're feeling things like you're, you're upbeat and you're festive and you're content and you're loving. But then there are also kids that are sad or depressed or angry or frustrated and they're in the blue and the red. So if you know where kids are entering in a given class, it really helps guide your instruction. And the purpose of ruler is for the kids to be able to recognize that they're feeling a certain way, understand it, label it, I am feeling frustrated, I am feeling content, I am feeling happy, um, and then be able to express it. And then ultimately, if they are in the blue or the red area, they're able to regulate and teach them how to have better moments um, so we kicked off all coming back from the pandemic with Mark Rackett coming here. We used some of our federal funds for this. And we kicked off um, using the ruler throughout the district. And again, um, Ms. Basilta is in the room, so I give a shout out. You can go tell Nicole I gave her another shout out. So um, they came up with the great idea of why don't we empower our kids to be little bracket leaders. So they developed a bracket leadership team where our kids went and developed lessons and came to the elementary schools and again reinforced lessons on um, the ruler program and that's been really great and then Ms. Basalter you know kind of trekked over to the middle school and kind of sprinkled a little bit of her magic there and now she has program team leaders here and it's all about empowering kids so that the kids have some control over their social emotional state um, so this is where we are now and we talk about success, like what is a successful child? And what we see is we see the kids that earn the awards at the 9-11 ceremony, or we see the kids that are bow and sell, or we see the kids that are top 25, or we see the kids that are um, all county and, and in football or wrestling or all state, or they get all these accolades, and you see that stuff on the top. But a whole lot of stuff has to go into making the kids that way, or they have to put a lot, I should say making they earn that through, you know, a lot of hard work, making, making really um, targeted decisions, determination, um, having over here, having the growth mindset, having good habits, using the habits of mind. So all of that is like the bottom of the iceberg, and you just see the big stuff. So we have to spend some time talking about those pieces that are below what you see, and how do we instill that in kids? So. This is who we are, right? So this is our mission statement. Seaford Union Free School District's purpose is to provide our students with a comprehensive educational program that will allow them to develop fully um, the necessary academic and social skills to become responsible and productive members of a democratic society. Very nice, right? So what we say is, well, why do we do what we do? So according to our current mission statement, okay, the why is students become responsible and productive members of democratic the how is through a comprehensive education, and the what is students develop academic and social skills. So we're going to suggest that we shift the why a little bit. And I'm a huge Simon Sinek systems person, and thinking about anytime we do something, we have to get at the core of why we're doing it, and it has to be a meaningful reason why we do something. So. So and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. It's a bullseye. In the middle is the word why. The center ring is the word how. And the outside ring is the word what. It's this little idea that distinguishes those that survived those three years. And more importantly, it's this little idea that is able to inspire people to join you in your pursuit. Every single organization on the planet knows what they do. You know the products you sell and the services you offer. Some organizations know how they do what they do. These are the things that we think make us special or better or stand out from our competition. But not very many organizations can clearly state why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. By why, I don't mean to have an exit strategy. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief. Why does your organization exist? Why did you get out of bed this morning? Okay, so, why do we do what we do? What's our core belief system in how we're developing 
markets. So we were saying, if we shift a little bit to say, well, what do we really want the end result to be? What if it, our why is students become learners and leaders who create a better present in the future? That's what we're really focused on. We're building the next generation. Then it becomes, well, how do we do that? Well, we have to provide teachers with the tools to innovate and create something new and better, right? I, I think the lift program is a good example. And then, well, what? We inspire our students to wonder, to explore, and to become leaders. And then that shifts where we are a little bit towards this idea that we're going to have learners and leaders who present, a, who create a better present and future. So the Secret Union Free School District's purpose is to provide our students with an innovative educational program that will empower students to develop their academic and social skills while becoming learners and leaders who create a better present and future in the democratic So, what is this inspired by? So, we started with the fixed mindset. We're talking about, I mean, uh, fixed mindset, growth mindset, the next level is an innovator's mindset. So, what we're going to talk about, well, what does innovation look like when we talk about creating an innovative educational program? What does that look like? You start with the present, the premise that change is the ability to do something amazing. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It sparks innovation. So to create a culture that encourages everybody to be a teacher and a learner, it sparks curiosity that empowers students to learn on their own. It inspires our students to wonder, to explore, and to become leaders. And professional development needs to foster a culture of innovation, not one size fits all. Teachers are empowered to innovate in the pursuit of providing optimal learning environments. So that's a shift. So we're going to explain, we spent a lot of time in the past, and I know I glossed over it today, the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset. What does an innovator's mindset really look like? So um, a couple of our educators, actually I was not there, um, went to Long Island ASCD and heard, and heard Jersey Hero speak that I really respect both within the district and some of my colleagues said, I can't believe you missed him address. Like, you really need to, you need to go get, get the book and, and listen to some of his podcasts. So I did. And um, so the next is a little blurb of, of um, in essence, what George Pirro says, Innovator's Mindset. In my book, The Innovator's Mindset, I, I wrote about Carol Dweck's work and she talks about the notion of fixed and growth mindset. When she talks about these two mindsets, thinking about them in the context of this talk or what you're seeing right now or what you're thinking, she talks about the idea of the fixed mindset. And this is the belief that abilities, intelligence, and talents are fixed traits so you can't actually grow over time. Now, reading something you know recently by Carol Dweck, she's not saying you either have a fixed or a growth mindset, but you have fixed and growth mindsets and different things. So, one of the examples I always talk about is I have a very fixed mindset when it comes to skydiving. I have no interest in learning skydiving, but when it comes to learning, how are we open to conversations? The growth mindset is the focus that the belief that abilities and intelligence can be developed over time. I think this is very crucial. That reminds me of this quote by Dylan Williams. And, and what he says is that if we create a culture where every teacher believes they need to improve, not because they are not good enough, but because they can be even better, there is no limit to what we can achieve. And having this growth mindset is actually crucial to education. But one of the things that I would actually challenge is that it's actually not enough anymore. That's why I developed the notion of the innovator's mindset. And it's actually a next level of these two mindset. And so the innovator's mindset is, de is defined as the belief that abilities, intelligence, and talents are developed so they lead to the creation of new and better ideas. It's not simply knowing, it's doing something with what you know. If you think about these three mindsets in the context of playing the piano, I think this is a, a great analogy for this. The fixed mindset, you would believe that with, there's no way that you could actually ever learn to play the piano. Growth mindset, you would understand with hard work, time, effort, those talents could actually be developed and you could learn to play. The innovator's mindset would actually say, not only will I learn to play, I will compose and create music. I will actually do something with what I know. And I think this is where we have to understand there is a true artistry to the way that we teach and as, as well as the way we learn. In my book, The Innovator's Mindset. Okay, okay so, in the innovator's mindset,
concept, the same way we have some um, terms with regards to habits of mind, um, he has um, characteristics of an integrator's mindset. And I'm not going to read them to everybody, but it's very similar things. We have risk takers and habits of mind. We have risk takers here. We have being resilient. We have persistence in, in habits of mind. So there are some things that are very similar, and there are some things that are kind of unique, like number four, being networked. Being networked means something very different to them. Being networked means whether you're connected by social media, whether you're connected in the relationships that you have, it means something. And the example that I will give in, in secret terms is um, our science research program. That is all based on networked connections. Whether you get to the right legs, whether you're meeting the right professors, maybe whether you're interviewing the right people when you're doing your research. So we talk about um, the generation of students that we have right now, and I can to having children that have graduated from high school and college, that network concept is very, very foreign to me. I mean, I watched my son navigate through LinkedIn like it was nothing, and it was all about creating doors and openings, and we need to teach kids how to do that. So, what did I take your slide? Oh, did I take your slide? I took her slide. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't so, stop talking. Go <laughs> back to that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Jacob. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the Board of Education for giving me this opportunity. I'm excited that the new teachers are here today because we're going to dive deep in new teacher orientation on this. Um, and just know that everything we're speaking about is not just from Dr. Poor and myself. It's actually from all the administrators. It's grassrooted from our educators from the K to 12. It's a lot of discussions. We take pride in doing a lot of research, taking books, diving deep into the books, and understanding what is the 21st century, the current practices, and then embed it and make Seaford even going stronger and further in the education. So um, George Curis, as Dr. Cora mentioned, this is his innovator's mindset, and these are the skills that inquires that innovation. But in addition, we've had opportunities to speak to him, either on the weekend, having the individual meetings, really understanding what we've been doing here at Seaford. So we didn't want to make, we wanted to make sure that everything we've done, like habits of mind, ruler, it's not put away to the side, but it's also enhancing. You know, these programs that we're implementing with our children, it's an important piece, but now we're actually coming together, making it one, and making it a secret uh, scholar profile. So if we go into here, this is the research that we were talking about. Uh, world Economic Top 10 Skills in 2025. So what does that include for our students? In 2025, what are the skills that they're gonna need? So we need to create an environment in which students develop dispositions that will make them present and future leaders. So in the World Economic Forum, you see that they highlight all of this, and we boxed out the word innovation. And what you see is the color coordination, so problem solving is blue, self-management, working with people, technology use and development. So a lot of our professional development is being focused on that innovation, that idea of inquiry-based learning, that idea for them to grapple with the resources and then make the educated decision, but using research and knowledge to support what that why is. Here's another piece of research. Um, Dr. Pecora and I, I mean, we talk 24-7, literally 24-7, so this is like coming in at four o'clock in the morning from an email from Dr. Pecora and saying, hey, Sheena, why don't you read this? Right? <laughs> and the magazine's Education Week. This just recently came out. So we did a tour. Uh, Dr. Bakura and I did a tour with professional development. We went to the high school, we went to the middle school, and we spoke to the elementary. And this article came out in May 15, 2023. And I think this was important because in this article, and we presented to our faculty and staff and our administrators, and we gave them this resource because when you look through this article, you're taking a look at uh, people who started businesses, researchers, higher ed institutions, they're making these quotes and they're talking about this innovation and this idea of this mindset. So I'm just gonna pull out this uh, quote in itself. I'm just gonna read this. It's Michael Horn, a co-founder of Clayton Christensen. And I know it's a little bit small, but he writes in his piece, the most important will be the students master critical habits of success, self-regulation, executive function skills, growth mindset, agency, self-direction, curiosity, metacognition, such that they are able to continually learn new knowledge and skills as the world continues to change rapidly. This verbiage that he's using in May 2023 
is all the verbiage, all the words that we've been saying for years now. And it's nice because it validates everything we're doing here at Seedler. So he talks about this idea of disruptive innovation. And disruptive innovation, just gonna give you a little historical context before I show you the uh, little clip of video. Um, he talks about this idea that is, you innovate an idea, but it's only accessible for the affluent and for a small group. Disruptive innovation is making that or that idea available to everyone in the demographics and making it a popular that it's feasible to get. And you make better present and future. Yes, and you're making a better present and future. So I'm just gonna show you a clip because you're gonna have that aha moment when he actually talks about that one piece. We hope you have the aha moment. <laughs> we have the aha moment. Hello, I'm Des Dillon. Welcome to The Idea. My guest today is Professor Clayton Christensen. Clay, welcome. Oh, thanks, Des. What exactly is disruptive innovation? Explain. A disruptive innovation is not a breakthrough innovation that makes uh, good products a lot better. But it, we, it has a very specific definition, and that is it transforms a product that historically was so expensive and uh, complicated that only a few people with a lot of money and a lot of skill had access to it. The disruptive innovation makes it so more, so much more affordable and accessible that a much larger population have access to it. So give us an example of this. I mean, most people are familiar with the computer industry and how that's developed. Perhaps you can use that as an example. Yeah, so at the beginning, the, the first manifestation of digital technology was a mainframe computer. It cost several million dollars to buy, and it took years to be trained to operate these things. And so that meant that the largest corporations and the largest universities could have one. You know? And so we had to take our problem to the center where the experts solved it for us. But then there's a sequence of innovations from the mainframe to a mini to a desktop to a laptop and now to a smartphone that has democratized technology to the point that everybody has access to it around the world. And we are much better off. It was very hard though for the pioneers of the industry to catch these new waves. Most of those were uh, created and dominated by new companies. And that, I mean, you're touching on that gives rise to this process gives rise to the innovators di dilemma, which was the title of, of your 1997 book. Yeah, that's right. And, but how how do people get around that? I mean, that dilemma. Can you explain the dilemma itself to us? Yeah. So the dilemma is, in in every company, every day, every year, people are going into senior management, knocking on the door, saying, "I got a new product for us." And some of those entail making better products that you could sell for higher prices to your best customers. A disruptive innovation generally has to c cause you to go after new markets, people who aren't your customers. And, uh, and the product that you want to sell them is something that is just so much more affordable and simple that your, your current customers can't buy it. And so the choice that you have to make is, should we? So, you know, if we go back to his original quote, and, you know, again, this is, um, this is the, the idea of the session put out by Harvard Business Review, Harvard Business Review. But if you go back to the concept that in order for our kids to be successful in the world today, they have to be innovative. We need to know what that means. They have to be able to have what
and you know, quite selfishly, but the future markets that people are going to be when they graduate from high school and go to college. So one of the things that I thought was reinforced, this is a shameless um, mommy moment here for me. So when, um, and it really emphasizes what we're talking about, about inquiry-based instruction and being innovative. So um, my son was in the engineering program at Gardner, and for one of his courses, the assignment was, the only assignment for the course was to create something that made the world a better place. That was it. So now we have the theoretical of what we're trying to do in our schools, and then we have, you know, key leaders in industry telling us this is what we need, and then we have the real life application that, you know, this is where our secondary, post-secondary education, where it's taking us. They want kids to be able to create things, and they want kids to be able to take things to the next level. So, you know, long and short, that's my, my cute little tongue down there. Um, and long and short, this was before the pandemic. They said, what would make the world a better place is kids don't wash their hands correctly. So we're going to have this device that's gonna go on faucets in the kids' bathrooms and schools, and that little circle thing that's gonna go around with the rainbow stuff, and when the, and the, when the rainbow and, the, and those sounds stop, then they don't wash their hands. And that was before the pandemic. So, you know, so the, the idea of where we are and where we want our kids to be, we want them to think of these things. We want them to get out there and kind of contribute to making the, the world at the next level. The one thing that I didn't mention that I, I did want to say, because when we do this in the administrators, when he was talking about the computers and he was talking about an innovation that we have out here right now that only really the obscenely wealthy people can, can have, you know, and he was talking about a mainframe computer, I'm asking the board. What is something right now that's out there that only the obscenely wealthy can do, and it's really cool, but in 10, 20 years, maybe it'll be accessible to everybody? Yes, right? So we have SpaceX, you have Elon Musk, you have all this stuff. So where are we going to be? And what are our kids that are in those industries? What are they gonna to have to be able to do? So we want them to start thinking that way. Okay. So we said, well, we're doing a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of theories that will kind of come together. So we said, for us in Seafood, what do we think the Seafood Scholar looks like? Out of all this, how do we bring Cooler together with growth mindset together, with grit, the work of Angela Duckworth, and then also with this new um, innovator's mindset? So can we identify what a Seafood Scholar looks like? And we have all these words, we have all these things. So we went out to the teachers and we asked what does the secret scholar look like? And it's actually it's kind of talk about the work that we do with them. This was part of the recording, you know, can you talk about it? <laughs> so as we're doing it, and before I start, because we're gonna show our um, work that we've been doing, I just want to acknowledge all the um, teachers and administrators, Eric, Deb Emmerich, Dr. Mori, um, I'm gonna introduce you three in a little bit, Dr. Leone, uh, Ms. Langone, uh, Ms. Kalei Lassan, and Ms. Basilica, and all our administrators that have been involved with this party, Mr. They have actually embedded this, and we couldn't be successful without our administration um, in doing these professional development sessions because they did a lot of the prep work before Dr. Kaur and I came in. So they actually started the work one session ahead, identifying, let's take a look at our students. Let's take a look at what the work that they're doing. So when Dr. Kaur and I came in, this is actually one of the pictures of the presentations and of the work that they were doing. We asked the question, what is it in Seaford High School do you see as a Seaford Scholar? So the activity was, you know, we, we created this sheet of words, but the sheet of words came from habits of mind. It came from rule. It came from work that we've done in the past because we didn't want to just leave that in the dust, right? We wanted to keep it coming with us. But we also asked them to incorporate some words that they felt when they saw a Seaford Scholar at the high school, what comes, what traits comes into mind. So on the right, we gave a uh, list of like the must-haves, then we talk, took a look at, okay, what is it gonna represent the high school? And here's some words that our high school teachers came up with. Listening with understanding, empathy, open-minded, flexibility, persistence, balance. And if you hear these words, you think back of the innovator's mindset, you think about habits of mind, you see the, the uh, consistency and the parallel that comes with it. Finding humor, creation, manage impulsivity, and the list goes on. So this took place in February. Now we shift over to the middle school. We, we retweet the presentation. We did the same work that we came in at the high school, and we asked them the same question, right, in middle school. And 
and we gave them those list of words and we gave them what they thought of what was important. And then these are the words, and if you see it as I'm saying it, it's gonna be consistent with the high school and these presentations were, de um, were designated on two different dates, two different places and locations. So they came up with caring, manage impulsivity, empathy, persistence, balance, questioning, problem solving, communication. This is what Secret Scholar at the middle school will look like. Now the idea was to have this E to 12 vertical alignment of Secret Scholar, right? So I'm in a manner, I'm at Harvard, and I sh we shared the work that the elementary groups were doing. You go into the building, you feel habits applied, you feel the work. You can walk to the bathroom and you can say, I'm angry because this mood meter is showing me that I'm angry, right, going to the bathroom. You know coming out. But then in the middle school and in the high school, what does that look like? Is that language coming up in the middle school? Is that vision coming up? And we wanted that to happen. So this idea, um, we created a Secret Scholar Profile Committee, which our educators have been working tremendously. We have a lot more members. I'm gonna call up our high school teachers and our middle school teacher. Uh, we have Erica, Caitlin, and Christina that will come up and present what the actual committee has been doing in this summer and what our vision is. So now specifically, we narrow 
narrow down these specific uh, ten traits here. So I'm going to start on the left hand side. Uh, communicators uh, was our first one here. We communicate with clarity and precision. We show empathy and understanding through active listening skills. And there are several habits of mind that fall into this as well as Bueller and Lion Quest. Um, the second one is being flexible. So we change perspectives, generate alternatives, and consider options by extending our thinking. We understand concepts like intelligence, leadership, personality, and ability can be developed and cultivated over time. Again, Ruler, Lions Quest, Habits of Mind also fall under this trait. Um, next is risk takers. We responsibly take risks and push our limits to try new, unfamiliar things. Again, a couple of Habits of Mind that fall under this category as well. Next, we have our innovators, so kind of working off of what uh, Dr. Kapoor was sharing with us before about her son's work, he wants students not to just be able to solve problems, but to like seek problems and find issues and things and be curious and question things around them and explore and be observant, um, which again, like uh, Eric was saying, it does include some of our habits of mind, which again is kind of keeping it all cohesive. We want our students to be reflective, so you know that's their meditative cognition, being aware of how they think, what works best for them, what doesn't work for them. Um, being principled, so upholding their beliefs and integrity, so really kind of sticking to a code of conduct and upholding the sort of integrity, and then being mindful, so being aware of their thoughts, feelings, and actions, and how they affect them themselves, and also those around them, obviously in school, outside of school, and while in school, but also in the future and in the rest of their lives. Um, so this is a new one for us, networkers, like we were talking about, that one is from the innovator's mindset, and getting our students to realize that there's more than just C creative, more than just STEM, but that they are part of a greater community, a part of a bigger society and, and you know, a global community as well. You know, once they leave Seaford, there's a lot more out there that they're going to interact with. And so getting them to see that not only do they create uh, networks within the classroom and in which at their home and in their teams, but that there's a world outside of school as well. Um, humorous, I mean, that we always like to find joy and laugh, right? If we don't laugh, we'll cry. So we want our students to um, find humor, you know, where appropriate, and be able to have that childlike ability to keep humor around. And then resilience, persisting with grit. Um, this is one that we spoke a lot about. It's very important for our students to complete um, their struggles and get past them. So the yet, right, the point of yet. Like we haven't done it yet, but we're not gonna stop. We're going to continue working and persist with grit. So that was another one of our so this creates our Seaford Scholar Profile. These are our 10 characteristics that we thought were most important for our students to achieve and accomplish in their K through 12 journey because we feel that that's going to help them in their future and throughout the rest of their lives. So. We do have a separate plan sort of at the elementary schools, the middle schools, and high schools. Um, I think we'll be speaking about that at one of the next board meetings and how we're beginning to roll that out.
colleagues out there, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've done because we had an idea, but it only becomes reality when people put in the grit and the hard work. And the, the dev was like at ground zero on so many things. And um, you know, I'll share one other thing because um, when I was hired here, like nobody really knew who I was because I was six years in Suffolk County. So Deb was working with Kevin and, and said, like, do you know who she is? <laughs> and Kevin said, oh, yeah, we've done a lot of work together on growth mindset. So Deb and I kind of had this connection um, before we even uh, started working together because we were interested in similar pedagogy. Jen and I had the pleasure of listening to the elementary presentation this afternoon with the three uh, members, oh, Kat and Carrie and Angelina. And I just want to say, um, we have three elementary teachers, Ms. Hanson, um, Ms. Black, and Ms. Lake, who have worked tremendously, that would want, wanted to be here, who couldn't. Um, they will be in the future. They'll be in the future. And Ms. Foley was going to be here as well, but uh, you know things came away, and she'll be here in the future. And you know, Erica, Caitlin, and Christina, they, everyone has done so much tremendous work, represented their buildings quite so specifically, and to make sure that this was really talked about, they, to communicate with their administrators, Yeah. 
Park, but also for their leadership and the partnership between the two schools. I mean, that's not something that I think we've always seen throughout the year, and I really do love to see it. I think it's just great um, to see both schools uniting, and these kids will end up together in sixth grade, and so it's great when they have opportunities to do things together and to um, celebrate achievements together. Um, and again, thank you.